So, uh, hi. Um, can everyone hear So, um, uh, thanks. My name is Andrew Carter. I'm the CEO of Fathom. Uh, we're based in the UK, um, so I apologize if I fall asleep halfway through this because I'm pretty jet lagged right now. But uh, just shout really loud or we'll wake up. So what we're doing at Fathom is we're trying to build a decentralized development platform. So we've spoken a lot of the last couple of days about integrating blockchain with games for game experience for the users. Well, we're trying to actually build a platform that allows game developers to create um, games in a decentralized way. So we just heard about um, massive uh, collaboration in terms of player-made generated content. Well, we're trying to do the same for, um, for generating the games themselves. So just to... There we go. Apologies. So when you're making a game, this is the bit you want to you want to focus on. You want to focus on your USP, the bit that makes your game original and unique. But to make your game successful, you need various other systems. Maybe it's in-app purchases, notifications, some live configuration, so you'd have to go through a long update cycle, telemetry, so you can um, determine. Uh, how your players are behaving in game. And then once you've released the game, you need other systems, you need analytics pipeline to reduce that data, you need to do user acquisition, you need to run sales, promotions, various other live up systems. So while you're building all of this, meanwhile, somewhere else across the world, someone else is building a different game with a different USP, and the, all of these identical systems. And it's a huge amount of reinvention, it's a huge amount of wasted work. So we wanted to say, well, is there a different way we could go about doing this? So what if game A, created half of those systems, game B created the other half, and then they shared the code. And if two games could do this, why not all games? So this is the philosophy we started to look at um, when we were building Fathom originally, when we started two years ago. Um, and when we thought about it, we thought, well, there's two, two actors in this process. There's uh, the author and there's the implementer. And if we set up this system pro properly, then the author gets an additional source of revenue. They're being paid whenever anyone is using the, the modules they create. And the implementer is saving time, saving resource. And both of them get a standardized means of implementing these systems. So both of them know exactly when they're building the next product and the product after that, it's the same integration process, it's the same, the same path. However, it's not that simple because the author now has an increased number of dependents. Everyone who's using their code is reliant on them. And if you're using various code for various different places as the implementer, you have an increased number of dependencies yourself. You also have increased maintenance responsibilities. You've got to keep it working. You've got to keep it updated. You've got to um, expand the scope, make sure you're compatible with new platforms, new drivers, etc. And ultimately, you, know, you don't know what the return on investment is. Um, so there's essentially far too much risk, which is why this problem hasn't been solved until now. When we've got a new set of technologies, a new set of capabilities and ethoses that can really start to, to mitigate these risks and ultimately eliminate them entirely. So that's the philosophy we started with for Fathom. And we thought, well, if this can be done with code, what else can this be done with? How can we expand this? How can this technology be properly applied to, make, to allow game developers to spend more of their time creating that U USP? and less of their time building the same systems, reinventing the same wheels over and over again. So we started with live ops. That was my background. Um, I started out as uh, Natural Motion, uh, and later at Zynga uh, as a data scientist and data engineer. Uh, I then moved on to Exient as director of live operations. And throughout this process, I've built three or four different data analytics pipelines. I've built and implemented various different live op systems, and a lot of them I've done multiple times. So when we started Fathom um, two years ago, we wanted to automate this. We wanted to remove all that reinvention and really create the shortcuts for game developers. So this is how LiveOps generally works. You have a development team led by a product manager, the centralized source of control that calls all the shots. And after a year or so of development, they release a live app. And you then need a server engineer to, to deliver some data to that app to control its live, live systems and live processes. And of course, you then need a data scientist to take the data, the, the telemetry from that app and convert that into insight in, in order to inform the live ops and inform the, the game performance and decisions that the product manager needs to make. But when we look at these three systems, these three roles, they're all very expensive. And there's various great tools out there that help these uh, roles do their jobs. Uh, Delta DNA are just in the other room. Um, but 
If you can't afford those in the first place, if you can't get that resource, if you don't have the time or the energy or simply the back on yourselves to know what to, how to implement the right data science or how to build these server engineered systems, you're still lost, you're still not being served properly. And there's no real solution in the middle of this yet that really links these two together, that helps the product manager do their job. You still need the data scientist to interpret the data, you still need the server engineer to implement the live systems. So. Let's look at one of these systems that we're talking about, in-app purchases, and let's look at what it would take to implement an ideal version of IAPs. So something that can be fully live configured, something that tracks all its telemetry data, and so on and so forth. So first off, if you're assuming you're on mobile, for sake of simplicity, you need to integrate with Apple, integrate with Google, implement with any other platforms you're releasing on. Um, and of course, after that, you need to handle the store purchases, any other store requirements. That's several days worth of work. Um, then you need to inf integrate some sort of live configuration so that you can modify these IAPs live, so you don't need to uh, go through a six, eight week update cycle if you need to change anything. You need to de decide how you're going to actually configure these in-app purchases and then you need to set up each one individually. Then you need to set up some sort of receipt verification system to stop it getting hacked. And then you need some handling inside the actual code to, to determine what happens if something fails validation. Then you need to design what telemetry you want to collect uh, in order to monitor the performance of the in-app purchases. Uh, you need to build that system. You need to build the system that reduces the analytics on the server. And you need something that can apply it again in order to actually make it useful. And finally, you actually need to hook all this into the UI of the game. Now, what we did uh, when we started building this is think, well, what's, what, what are the standards? What, are, what does every system need to work with? So live configuration. That's, some, that's a pretty complex system to set up. So we can standardize that. We can allow every single system to build on the same um, platform. And the same for analytics. There's no need for, for that to be the same and be generated every single time anyone implements any live system. Well, then what happens if we standardize in-app purchases themselves? And we get rid of almost all of the rest of the systems. So you don't need to worry about the cross-platform stuff anymore because it's in the standardized IAP module, the, the standardized way of implementing it. And all you're left with is, the set, is configuring the individual in-app purchases and it, hooking them up to the UI. And if we can do this for in-app purchases, we can do that for almost any other system you might need in more than one app, more than one game. And so these form what we call Fathom modules. And the modules uh, essentially slot into the game system, they integrate directly with the app, and they reduce several weeks of work, in some cases, down to one or two lines of code. And they eliminate that dependency on the server engineer because they are themselves fully live configurable, and they handle all of that uh, out of the box as standard. And at the same time, they're also taking over, gathering the data, standardizing the data, and setting that up to the server to be processed. So, how does that change how the live apps um, behave and how they operate? Well, if you've got the standard app on the left and we've got the other modules on, on the right, they're all sending data up and the data scientist then needs to take that data and calculate something from it in order to generate insight. So, let's take the very simplest thing that they could generate, daily active users. So what you have is you have all of those different apps generating data, is going into the script, and that's producing insight for the product managers. But all the ones based on a Fathom module don't need to worry about us having a separate script. They're all generating exactly the same data. And so they can all use the same script, and again, we've removed a huge amount of reinvention. We don't need multiple scripts, and they can generate much more insight because, unlike the app on the left, they're all benefiting from each other's data. Though all that data can go into a shared database, and if you know your daily active users fell yesterday, you also know if everyone else has fell yesterday. So you know if it's some, some, something problem wrong with your game or something wrong with every game in general. So these form the second decentralized part of the Fathom platform, which are the channels. And if we can do it for DAU, we can do it for much more complicated systems, even up to things like predictive analytics, performance projections, machine learning applications, and beyond. And these form the Fathom channels. And we'll come back to these a little bit later because they form a core part of the, actual, of the decentralized economy as well. But what they do is they replace the data scientist in this process. They can automatically reduce all of the data because it's standardized and directly surface the results to the product manager. So one more element left to solve. Now what we have here is insight coming from the channels and the product manager then takes that insight, makes some decisions and reconfigures the live modules, sends some instructions down to the game. So, what if that insight isn't quite good enough? What if the, the raw data isn't, isn't exactly what's required? Well, that's where we created uh, Fathom Insights. 
Well, what insights do is they're a standard, they're a smart report. They're a standardized way of doing a particular piece of analysis or research. So let's say you have the notifications module integrated into your game. You want to know when your notifications should be properly scheduled in order to optimize when they're generating new sessions. Well, a single channel isn't going to communicate to a non-technical product manager when that needs to be. But if you were to build a, a report that uh, took the data, analyzed it on a standardized basis, and simply reported that whether your notifications need to be scheduled earlier or later, then it could do that. And if you build that report, well, because all the data is standardized, that report then works for every single Fathom-powered app. So the product manager of any app now has a standardized way of, telling, of uh, assessing the performance of their notifications and of anything else that an insight could be created for. But I think we can do a bit better than that because we've standardized all the analytics and we've standardized the configurations. So for many systems, the product manager themselves is obsolete. We can replace them with an AI Fathom agent that instead of doing that analysis on the notifications and surfacing its out output as a report, it can just automatically reconfigure the notifications module to change when the notifications are scheduled and automatically optimize their performance. And what we have here at this point is we've standardized every single element. So the entire live ops loop of uh, assessing the performance um, with the Fathom channel, determining what behavior to take based on that performance with the agent, and reconfiguring, applying that change live with the module, all can all happen automatically, just with supervision online. So what happens here is we have the, the agent, the agent essentially replaces the product manager in that process and we've removed any dependency on a specialized skill set from LiveOps. Anyone at this point can properly uh, orchestrate their app simply by subscribing to the correct uh, systems that they want to implement. And, they can, and developers can spend much more time actually implementing the USPs of their games. So this is the platform itself. Where does blockchain come in? Well, this platform can be entirely decentralized, and that's what we're going to do. Every single one of these elements will be able to be created by anyone. Anyone will be able to build a module, anyone will be able to build a channel, anyone will be able to write an insight or author an agent, and they'll be able to uh, enter it into the decentralized registry, and then anyone else will be able to subscribe to that uh, and benefit from it. And here's how that will work. So data consumers, anyone who wants to access that data, they will pay for data from the channels uh, using uh, for the Fathom token. Those tokens are then distributed back to the developers who contributed that data in the first place. So if you, if you integrate Fathom, then you're there getting a new source of revenue for your game data. At the same time, uh, some proportion royalties from each of those um, queries is going back to the creator of the module. So whoever created that system, whoever added that to the capabilities of the platform is benefiting uh, from every single query that they help to, to serve. Now the developers can then spend the tokens they get on agents, on insights, and subscribing to the realized value of their data. And whenever the, an agent participates in that, it's paying for the queries that it's using from the channels. And so that data itself is being paid for from the other developers. And so the economy loop continues. And again, whoever created that agent or that insight is receiving commission on all of those queries. And of course, the developers and the creators are receiving those tokens. If the consumers want those tokens, they can purchase them via exchanges, via other mechanisms from the developers and creators themselves. And you can see here we have a vibrant uh, economy whereby there's a, a multitude of sources and sinks. And back in my days, uh, Natural Motion, Zynga, and Exion, I was the guy who used to build the in-game economies. I was the guy who would spend ages with a spreadsheet balancing these things. And what you want in a healthy economy uh, is a large number of sources and sinks. You want a large number of levers you can pull to properly balance it. I'm not going to go into the, the full workings of the, uh, the Fathom economy today, but if anyone wants to grab me af afterwards and ask, I, would, I will happily talk your ear off about it for hours. <laughs> um, so the, uh, what we've done here is essentially, by creating the Fathom platform, we have decentralized and standardized these three elements of the system. But there's a lot more here. And so this is the call to action I wanted to say today, is we can properly make a, I'm going to steal, steal that term from earlier, a massively collaborative system to allow anyone to build games. And the philosophy we want to have with it is everyone should be able to rely on only their skill set. If you're, a, if you're a coder, you should be able to build a game. You shouldn't need to have a data scientist working with you to make your game successful. You should be able to rely on a source of that knowledge and a source of that, um, that capability um, from the value you can already generate yourself. And the same for, for every single possible uh, role in this process. So we've taken those three, and I hope various people in here will work on the others. And if you, if you do, if you've already got some ideas, if you're already working towards that, come find me, come talk to us. We'd love to collaborate with you on that. 
So if you have any more questions, uh, you can f get in touch on our website. Uh, you can get, get into our Telegram group, um, and just or just find me after this. Thank you very much. Hey, okay, anyone have any questions? Oh, 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 oh. hang on, I, I, I will not take the. Uh, uh, <laughs> over to you. Microphones. Can you come down the front, gentlemen? Down the front. I'll leave it to you to, to yeah. point fingers. <laughs> yeah, no, but so everyone else can hear. Just you can say who you are as well. So, do you consider what you're doing with that? Can you say who you are and yeah, your name um, and what company you're with? Uh, Brett Leonard with uh, Studio Lightship. And I'm mm -hmm. talking later today at 4:20. Um, are you considering yourself a platform for development for this kind of? A decentralized platform, yes. Decentralized ecosystem, in yes. a sense? One thing we've, we've struggled with is finding a terse way of describing ourselves. Yeah, no kidding. I, we've I, gone I back and forth with, with engine, with platform, with all sorts of different things, and uh, at the moment we're just we're you know, actually building the value, and we'll, figure, we'll let the community I decide. I think the word platform needs to be 86, <laughs> because it doesn't mean anything anymore. Yeah. Like, what yeah. is, you know, so I think an ecosystem is probably better in the context of this, but thanks. Um, I'd love to talk to you about this, because this is exactly sort of a back end for a whole story world thing we're doing. Great. Some pretty Good. significant okay. partners. Well, we, we, another thing to say, uh, we're hoping to ramp up a beta program uh, in the summer. So anyone who's interested in getting their app involved in that, uh, let me know. And we'll, put you, we'll be in touch. It is. Oh, uh, maybe that. Hi. <laughs> Speak loudly. Speak loudly. Hi. That's it. Misan from Codewax. Uh, we recently launched a mobile game based on Ethereum, mm -hmm. and we, we went through all the pains that you described. I think it's a really great project, but what is this project, um, what are the advantages of this project over Unity Store, App Store, or other open source projects? So, because they are decentralized in, in some way, right? Yes, so the core of it is the standardization um, and the, 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 the trustlessness that that enables. Uh, if you're building on something from the, the Unity App Store, then you can take a, a template game and, and fill that out, but you might find yourself encountering various different bugs, various different compatibility issues. Uh, we know ourselves from experience, we started, um, we, we took a few Unity App Store apps uh, to start building out as demos. We found ourselves essentially ripping out half of them um, to build them differently because some of them hadn't been updated in a few years, some of them had issues with Android and so on and so forth. Uh, and that's fine for the Unity App Store because it's not trying to be anything more than that. It's trying to be just a, a, a source of, of, of those projects. What we're trying to do is create a standard um, so people can rely on it and people can build commercial enterprises on top of it. Um, so the hope is that there will be a, a single standard for in-app purchases and anyone wanting to collaborate and who thinks they've got a way of making that better can make that single module a bit better, can work as part of that project and will be rewarded for doing so. Uh, and then everyone who is part of that community who has an interest in that project Project can then work towards the maintenance and the upgrading and the expansion uh, of that single module, and anyone else can just depend upon that. Um, and they will, they will, it's safe in the knowledge that it will be secured by smart contracts. The people who are maintaining it are incentivized to do so, so they have that reliability there. And they can just worry about focusing on the parts of the, the project they want to build. Uh, if they want to build an app purchase system, then great, they can get involved in, in maintaining and expanding the app purchase module. Or they can build a, another module, a sales module, or something that sits on top of it. But uh, at, that, at that point, we want to create a, a kind of universal catalog of these systems so that much more development time gets spent creating unique original content, which is really what we all want to be doing as game developers, right? It's, that's, that's what inspires us. There's very few of us, I know because I'm one of them, who spend their time wanting to build interesting data pipelines. It's, you know, we're freaks, but th and this platform works for us as well. Okay, uh, oh. uh, one, one gentleman there and then down the front. Hi, uh, my name is Barbara from Mindstorm. Um, this, this looks very promising and very excellent. I mean, we run a lot of mid-core games and whatnot, and if this truly can happen, this would be awesome. <laughs> but uh, having worked with things like um, Upside and, uh, you know, in the past, Playhaven and whatnot, mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of people have tried stuff like this in the past with centralized solutions. Mm -hmm. um, so number one, you know, how do you plan on uh, how do you envision some standard to actually come into play? Because as you go decentralized and more developers create stuff, mm. I can imagine as a product manager, one of the biggest challenges is uh, standardizing what works and what doesn't. Yes. Uh, that's one. Number two, you know, most of these tools in the market t typically have been cost prohibitive. For indies, even mid-level studios coming in, you know, if you don't have the budget, just, you're just priced out. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you plan on using the Fathom token, but what's the entry point into saying, hey, I'm a developer, 
I want to get going with this, you know, how so do I get going? So all modules will be free. Um, our, original, our original business model before we um, Act before we put, build the blockchain in was to allow uh, to have the modules out there for free and to monetize the data. And what we did with the, when we introduced the tokens is simply turn that around and say, well, we, we'll, we will make sure that everyone benefits when that data generates value. Um, and what we can really do with the data standardization is drill down in, a lot deeper into that value than the, a lot of the existing platforms that are out there, because. I mean, most of the uh, analytic solutions that are out there, uh, they require the developers to define what data they want to collect. And that immediately sets up barriers, because if you want to compare two games, you've got to do the work to compare those two data sets. If you want to compare 10 games, that's 100 different possible links that you need to, to explore. Whereas if you've got a standardized data set, that can all happen automatically. So that means that we, we can drill down a lot more deeper without uh, um, the prohibitive, as you said, uh, amount of work to be able to do that. Um, so in terms of the, the business model, that's how we'll um, allow that to, to happen. Everyone will be able to just download the module and use it. And that, w that benefits everyone, because the creator of the module, once they want a minimum barrier to entry, they want anyone to be able to use their system, because the more people who use it, the more data it's generating. The more data it's generating, the more value is going to be realized from that data, and therefore the more tokens they're going to receive whenever that data is used. So, and every single part that, ad that adds to this platform, every new module, every new channel, every new insight, it's all just increasing the token demand. So it, w it benefits the entire economy as a whole. And one question. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, Mark. You can say who you, you are. And who uh, you my name's David Albright with Triforce Tokens. Mm -hmm. um, I had a quick question about seeding your initial developments. How are you going to generate the domain-specific development labor or resources uh, to balance and actually complete uh, your initial projects? Uh, so we'll be winning an ICO um, relatively soon. Um, I, I'm not here to advertise that, so I'll, uh, I won't say any more than that about that. Uh, we haven't announced dates yet. We're hopefully not too far away from that. But if you want to talk to me about that, by all means do. Uh, same goes for everyone else. Lovely. Thank you. Thanks for watching.